All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you guys for attending uh, Essential 3D Printing Tools. Uh, my boss and I were having a conversation about some post-processing methods, and it sort of inevitably involved into, well, Drew, you know quite a bit about this. You should throw together a presentation and, and, and do a webinar on, on post-processing and what kind of tools are required. Um, I, I threw this presentation together pretty quick, and uh, it's, Im it's important that I want you guys to know I will stay and answer questions after this, so please feel free to uh, use the chat box or the questions, and uh, we'll go through those at the end of this presentation. But to get started, who am I? Hi, I'm Drew Davis. I'm a manufacturing application engineer here for Go Engineer. I work for uh, both teams, essentially, the RP team and the SolidWorks team. And uh, I, I specialize in SolidWorks plastics. Uh, I suppose if you guys have any questions about that, we could talk about that as well. So 3D printing is big. Um, there are a lot of technologies out there. Um, as most of you know, uh, you can now 3D print metal. Uh, it's it's pretty wild stuff, and and the technology is only um, really evolving to be more efficient, faster, more accurate, more realistic. Uh, the slide shows various different types of uh, 3D printing technologies, but today I'm going to focus on uh, what Stratasys really excels at. Uh, which is FDM and PolyJet uh, 3D printing. Now for a quick overview, what is FDM? Uh, first off, FDM stands for Fused Deposition Modeling. It's essentially taking thermoplastic filament and extruding it uh, in a finer uh, diameter to build parts. Uh, Stratasys FDM uses uh, support material as well. So it prints in both model and support, uh, and that's why Stratasys printers are able to, to build such unique and, and uh, wild geometry, things that can't be manufactured any other way. On the other hand, polyjet technology is more like a, uh, a inkjet printer, if you will. There is a print head with a series of nozzles that travels in X, it steps in Y, and deposits material that is UV cured. These are very accurate, very, very high resolution prints. And so because we have these two different technologies, uh, they, they definitely diverge in their applications and, and their uh, capabilities. FDM technology really excels in the the true rugged and durable applications. So uh, so actual jigs, fixtures, uh, end use parts. That's where FDM excels. Polyjet, on the other hand, is very accurate, very realistic. Uh, a new printer just came out recently called the J750 that can that can do photorealistic parts and actually use um, Adobe Photoshop now to, to drive some of the details in the parts. We've got an example towards the end of the presentation of that. But those parts are not necessarily as functional, not necessarily as strong as an FDM print. So we're here to talk about part post-processing. And why is that important? Why, why is post-processing important? Well, it's not always the case that you get the perfect part right off the printer. Sometimes you need to finesse it a little bit. Sometimes it requires sanding or painting. Sometimes it needs to be a marketing piece or something to that effect. And so the resolution or, or, or it needs to, to have real, um, a real appearance and it doesn't necessarily come off the printer that way. Good news is we can 
paint, we can plate, we can do a lot of things to our 3D printed parts to make them make them better, make them what we need them to be. But first, it starts on the printer. There are things we can do to get good aesthetics, good functionality, or, or optimize the mechanical properties. With regards to aesthetics, one of the first things we need to pay attention to is the STL resolution. Now, I'm going to walk you guys through a bunch of things you can do up front before the part's actually printed. So STL resolution is, is first and foremost, it's, it's an obvious thing, but it, it needs to be as high as you can get it without producing a ridiculously high file size. So I have three examples here of, of you know, a sphere exported to STL in, in three resolutions. Um, of course, the first one you see is pretty coarse, poor faceting. Uh, the middle one is maybe excessively fine. The resolution is almost too good. Let's say we're going to print this on our FDM printer. It, the FDM printer is not going to print fine enough resolution to, to really appreciate that file size, that file resolution. So uh, somewhere in the middle, our third picture there would be ideal. Now, in terms of post-processing, in order to reduce some of the work we have to do on the back end, the manual work we have to do, uh, we, can, we can optimize our print to eliminate some of it. Um, layer height is the first and foremost uh, uh, best way to reduce post-processing. You can see on the, the little boat model over here, this is a huge difference just because of the layer resolution. This is, a, this is an angled surface, so we see the stair-stepping of this pretty coarse, pretty rough uh, uh, print whereas I can hardly see any stepping over here where the, the layer resolution is much finer. And, I mean, it goes without saying on the little uh, knight chess piece over here, this would need a lot of work to get it to even look this good. So another thing to add is printer maintenance. There's a lot of just general upkeep, upkeep you can do to your 3D printer uh, to keep things printing as accurately and appropriately as possible. Uh, the picture here, though, shows the effects of lots of extrusion of plastic through a metal nozzle. Now, I believe this was a carbon-infused open source material, so this wasn't necessarily done on a Stratasys printer, but all plastics are ablative, they're abrasive, they're going to wear away uh, any, any material really eventually. And so make sure, making sure you've got a good new fresh nozzle on can help a lot with the type of work and the amount of work you're going to have to do on the back end. And again, with regards to that, part orientation has a huge effect. Now, specifically with FDM, uh, building something like, like this yoke with this large sweeping curve and there's another curve in this direction, if I build that in the wrong orientation, I'm going to have quite a bit of work to do. But uh, if I can optimize the print, then I can take a lot of work away on the back end. Uh, I actually have examples of that part printed. So here it is laying flat and you can see the stair stepping. Not ideal. The next print was stood up. Um, might be the best orientation for this part, especially considering this, uh, this uh, arc right here. And then finally, printed flat, sort of in that orientation. Uh, standing up with uh, this as the top surface. You know, we, we get the benefit of the contour lines on this uh, this arc here, but 
we see some stair stepping in this orientation right here. So orientation has a huge effect. Now, what are the issues that we're going to be fixing? What are the issues we're going to run into and need to fix in our post-processing? One of the first and foremost, particularly with FDM, is stair-stepping. Um, if you guys are familiar with FDM, you, you understand already. What we're taking is our file, and we're splitting it up in, in the resolution that we're, uh, we're printing our models in. And so with arcs like this, that resolution can really break those arcs up into segregated layers. Uh, again, changing the layer resolution has a substantial effect on this stair-stepping, but sometimes it's unavoidable. Another issue is seams. Now, specific with FDM, again, the seams are, are uh, a result of the uh, start and stop of the toolpath on each layer. And it's something that is just inherent with FDM 3D printing, sort of unavoidable to some extent. One of the ways you can reduce it is, again, make sh making sure your, your nozzles are new and clean, making sure your material is dry. That's another big thing. One of the other Another issue we're fixing is um, burn marks or embedded support material. Uh, I've got two pretty rough examples of parts that have uh, burn marks in them or embedded support. Th th these types of issues manifest usually when there's material that's come that's drooled out of the nozzle, sort of curled up and reattached itself to the exterior of the the, the extruder tip. Um, it continues to sit there and cook and cook until it finally dislodges and embeds itself in your part. They're always a bummer. Um, and to some extent, you'll never be able to hide them, but you can do things like, like dig those areas out and uh, either hot air weld or uh, use a uh, soldering tool to maybe fill those areas with the, the original plastic. Now, if you're going to paint your part, or if you're going to uh, coat it with something, maybe you don't need to worry about it. You just need to prime the surface and, and make sure it's smooth and flat, and you can just hide it with paint. But these are issues uh, that are less common now with our Stratasys printers, but you may run into them on an open source printer. And then strings. Again, these parts are all off of open source printers. Uh, this kind of issue typically manifests itself when your material is particularly wet. Um, Stratasys does a great job of making sure that its canisters are sealed and dried. Uh, it also does a good job of material handling when the ma material is loaded into the machine. Uh, it keeps your material dry. And so you don't see a lot of these issues, but um, Back in the day when I worked at Stratasys, uh, we had an older machine called the Maxim, and the spools for that material were, weren't sealed. They weren't contained in any way. And this was in Minnesota, mind you. So in the summer, humidity was an issue. It got, it, it got real humid. And even if we air-conditioned the room, you know, there was still some atmospheric moisture. But uh, as soon as we started putting those exposed material spools in dry boxes and just limiting their exposure to that atmospheric moisture. These types of issues, this, this, these strings and these drooling issues, virtually went away. Now, we're here to talk about tools and I, I put together a list, a quick list of things that I think you must have. Um, I took a picture here in the shop over there. This is my go-to grab box of tools. I've got a needle nose plier. Um, I actually have a couple sets of needle nose pliers there. I got side clippers, uh, some files, some small chisels, 
um, a little dental pick, a bigger chisel. I use that in in I use that to remove support uh, from like the base of a part. And finally, sandpaper and um, a little Scotch Brite. I I really wanted to focus on the chisels. Now, in my opinion, if you're not gonna invest a ton of money in your post processing tools go do do yourself a favor and buy one flat chisel one small flat chisel it doesn't need to be very wide but i'm so familiar with using this tool that i can clean up seams i can remove support material from from my part um I can use a chisel to dig out embedded support or clean up string issues. I mean, this is the most versatile tool in my toolbox. And that's that's why I wanted to really emphasize using it. Another important tool we have in our shop here is our Dremel. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's odd because I, I find a new use for our Dremel almost every day. Uh, now, I'm not trying to use it to really grind down, you know, seams or any kind of odd issues. I'm not using it to polish my entire part. I typically use sandpaper for that because uh, this, can, this can be a little too aggressive sometimes. But it, it, it's got so many uses. It's just nice to have around. You, you, once you have it sitting in the toolbox, you'll find ways to use it. And finally, painting equipment. Now, you, in this picture, you can see that XTC 3D product. Um, they came out with that product, and, and really it's kind of become the gold standard for sealing prints. Um, in my opinion, it does a really great job of getting you an injection mold quality part off of your FDM printer, but in some instances, it's a little too aggressive. So uh, I like to keep acetone around, and uh, and I also like to keep um, a horsehair paintbrush uh, in a couple sizes. It's important you not try and use a nylon paintbrush or any other foam paintbrush with your acetone. Uh, you'll find out the hard way if you do. <laughs> those paint brushes will tend to melt and dissolve and fall apart. Uh, so the horsehair paintbrush is why it's really important. And if you get a good quality one, that can really, it can clean up some of your parts uh, pretty well. Um, notice, I, I don't really do any vapor smoothing. Uh, Stratasys actually has a product called the uh, smoothing station. Uh, that does an amazing job. I don't recommend you guys go get a paint can with uh, <laughs> with some acetone in the bottom or, or any other sort of situation like that. I've, I've heard of those exploding. Uh, painting is a great way. Painting acetone on is a, is a quick and easy way to get that, um, to get a good surface finish done. I usually do that process, paint my parts before paint uh I'm sorry yeah paint my parts with acetone before I paint with actual paint or before I prime my parts with uh with uh any kind of spray paint or anything so what are some of the outcomes you can get for post processing let's go into that obviously I already started talking about this smoothing parts this is this owl here represents a, a pretty realistic finish you can get from that XTC product. Um, it's it's high gloss. It's it's put on there pretty thick, and so it builds up pretty thick. Um, if that's a little too thick, or you need resolution, or you need to maintain your accuracy. Uh, that may not be the product for you. It may benefit you more to to lightly paint with acetone to seal the part or, or even just use um, a, a plastic primer or even a modeling putty and fill some of those voids, then paint. Um, 
I've sent some parts over to Repliform before, repliforminc.com. Uh, they are experts at plating parts. They're the gold standard of part plating. And so these are actually some examples of uh, those parts, parts that have been printed and then plated. They will actually do any, any uh, 3D print technology out there. And what's kind of nice is um, they've got a real hands-on approach. You know, I, I was afraid I was just going to send a quote and the computer was going to spit something back. But no, I actually got on the phone and, and spoke with somebody, which was nice. They kind of walked me through their process and walked me through what I needed to send them. Um, the, nice, the nice thing about Repliform is that they don't require you to do any of your own post-processing. You're going to need to clean up seams and whatnot, but you don't need to seal your own part. They're going to do all of that process uh, in their facility where they most likely own a vapor smoothing station. Uh, but the outcome of the plated part is actually you get the benefit of increased mechanical properties, increased part strength uh, from the plating buildup. That's pretty good. And I mentioned polyjet, uh, clear polyjet parts. The process to get here is uh, very simple. Uh, the the quick and easy way is you take a, you take your sandpaper, you take a, a bowl of water, and you wet sand things. I start with a, I start with about an 800 grit, and I inevitably work to a 1200 grit. It takes me about 15 minutes, depending on the geometry. Um, and then once I'm done and the parts been washed and dried, I'll usually hit it with a, a high gloss clear coat spray paint just to fill any remaining voids that are that are rem, uh, that are still there from um, the sanding process. And what's left is really high finish, high gloss and depending on the material, clear, 3D prints off of your PolyJet printer. I use this picture because this is the new go-to sample for our new J750 3D printer. Um, you're seeing a bunch of different colors, a bunch of different materials there. Our J750 can actually uh, mix up to six materials at the same time. So it, it can do realistic high gloss parts. It can do wood grain finish parts. And they're, they're truly um, end use realistic parts. It's, it's amazing. Okay, it's questions time. Feel free to hop into the chat window and uh, ask some questions. If nobody has any questions, um, that was it. It was, uh, it was pretty quick. But uh, feel free, take down my email address and uh, email me later. Okay, here we go. We got some questions coming in. How thin can I make my layers? Um, that's going to depend on your, um, your printer. I'm assuming you're referring to uh, the, the printer resolution. Maybe you're not. Uh, Craig, I don't know, but uh, your resolution is going to be determined by your printer. Um, our 3D printers can go down to uh, 16, actually 14 micron on our polyjet side and uh, five thousandths of an inch on our FDM side. Uh, with regards to uh, the plating process, Repliform uh, their layers, uh, they prefer to put about a five, uh, a five mil uh, plate on parts. They find that that's kind of the, the sweet spot. You get the benefit of the strength 
and it builds up enough that they they can achieve pretty much any finish they want so they could buff it and get you a really chrome finished look or they can leave it uh, leave it uh, sort of raw a little matte finish uh, their their site repliform inc.com has uh, a really good description of the different resolutions or different uh, surface finishes you can get okay Joshua asks what's the best way to place threads in a 3d printed part Josh that's a great question um, there's a bunch of different methods uh, and it, it a little bit it depends on the material you're using the printer you're using but a good rule of thumb is um, if you've got a Fortis level printer with the Insight software on the FDM side, uh, you can actually take whatever hole or whatever boss it is and, and build up uh, concentric uh, contour lines. So you get a good thick section of meat, if you will, quote unquote, <laughs> to uh, cut threads into. Now, if that's not ideal, uh, one of the tools I use is um, Allen key or Allen um, bits. I'll use my drill. I'll put an Allen bit the the size that I want uh, my hole to be on there, and then I'll actually sort of ream ream my holes out. And that's another nice way to to get a good um, a good hole to cut threads into. Um, once you've got a hole the right diameter another method you could use is is press pressing brass inserts in or heat staking brass inserts in uh, that have threads though that's a bomb proof way to get threads in a part I've, I've got a sample that I carry around whenever I do uh, demos and those threads um, yeah, I, I tell the customer to crank away on those threads and they creak a little but that's mostly just the the two parts uh, that you're fastening together with the brass threads and the bolt uh, kind of squishing together. Uh, I have yet to pull those threads out of the hole. Yeah. Or, yeah, that's a great uh, point. We can use self-threading screws uh, to, to uh, instead of tapping holes, you can just use self-threading screws uh, to fasten things together. Um, I have a SolidWorks Plastics question. Awesome. Which SolidWorks Plastics uh, packages are there? Um, there's three packages of SolidWorks Plastics, um, the standard, the pro, and the premium. And the, uh, the difference really is the capability. Uh, if you want to simulate injection molding and just get designed for manufacturability, standard can usually get you there. Um, it's essentially going to give you an, an idea of, of what kind of molding issues you'll run into. Um, so uh, air traps, uh, weld lines, things like that. Um, you can get a quick view right away. Now uh, going to the Pro gives you the ability to add the pack phase of the injection mold cycle, which is beneficial too because it, it it really can give you an idea where um, you're going to see stresses internal to the part when it's ejected. And then finally, premium uh, it can give you all three. It can give you flow, pack, and warp uh, and really show you what your part's going to look like when it drops into the chute. And you can see, you can see before you actually cut any steel. Um, one thing I actually wanted to bring up that I didn't include in my presentation, um, I, I listed on the essential tools uh, a soldering gun. With Stratasys, um, with some of this higher end Stratasys 3D printers, you can actually print in a, an Ultim material, a high, high temperature aerospace grade plastic. And you can do hot air welding using a heat gun that focuses its its blast, if you will, down to a very small um, small area. 
but with Ultim, I, I found that the process for doing a quick plastic weld was better with a soldering gun. And so the process that I used essentially was I, I sort of heated up heated up the the part here and then used uh, this is actually a picture of me sort of tacking things together. So so what what ended up happening on this part is the manual support removal process ended up fracturing this part um, in a small area and it was it was a hot part so we needed to get this out the door quickly and so I volunteered to do some welding. Uh, first thing I did was I tacked it together to make sure that everything fit back together the way it needed to fit. Um, and then you can actually see in this picture, I sort of heated the part while feeding in raw uh, filament. And it, it, was, uh, it was an interesting process. Uh, it was the first time I've done this to Ultim material. And it it took some doing, uh, <laughs> but we ended up with a pretty good pretty good uh, end result. Um, what you see here a little bit is some degradation of the plastic, and this is after sanding. The important surface was this internal surface, so we had to keep that smooth. Um, the backside not so pretty, but mechanically. I'd stand by this. Uh, I, these the, these welds are substantial. They're going to hold. It's a it's a good it's good weld. So I have another question actually about the J750 workflow. Um, with the J750, the new release of the the printer, they actually released new software as well, and the the software is it, it is awesome. It it actually is a lot more user friendly. It's got a nice looks like a nice streamlined um, uh, interface, and the way that it works, you can use the old method from the Conex Three, where you can assign colors and materials to shells or bodies of your part of your STL, um, or you can actually use a, a texture process where you, you import the actual physical model and then wrap it with a texture uh, or essentially a JPEG uh, image. And the Polyjet Studio uh, does a great job of, of wrapping those to, um, uh, to files together and making things look pretty realistic, um, pretty amazing. Uh, one example I've got here, it's I pulled this off the internet obviously, but that's it's a wood grain finish that's not it's not hydro dipped or, or hydro painted. That's actually been designed and, and printed on the part. Um, and uh, that was done by exporting the wood grain image as a separate file and applying it within Polyjet Studio. Any other questions or thoughts? Again, feel free to uh, take down my email and, and email me any questions as they come to you. Thank you very much for the, uh, the attendance. I appreciate your attention. You guys have a great day. Mm -hmm.